Uh, tonight's speaker is Arnie Hendon, past director of the AAVSO and legacy fellow of AAS. Uh, I'm really curious about this one, making telescopes robotic. And he gives a, a good example of it. Um, you can see the description of the talk on the slide, in addition to his uh, quite lengthy and well-qualified credentials to speak on this topic. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Arnie. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Let's see. All right. So can we see the screen all right? Yes. OK, good. Um, I wanted to talk tonight about taking your telescope or, or using a telescope that's remote. So you know, if you use a telescope in your backyard or if you go to the observing site and use a telescope there, that's one thing. But if you really want to utilize the, the maximum number of hours of the night, it's awfully nice to have a fully robotic telescope that it just goes off and observes objects for you. And you can go to sleep and wake up in the morning and all your data is sitting there waiting uh, to be processed. And um, the AVSO has been involved in this for a long time. And so I thought I would give you an example of the, the network of telescopes that the AVSO has and then proceed from there to setting up your own telescope. So before we really get started, I wanted to uh, acknowledge um, a large number of people that have been involved with AVSO NET. Uh, Tezic Mon Foundation in New Mexico um, loaned us on long-term loans some very expensive equipment. And we're just really thrilled to be able to use that. And then there were a couple large grants or donations uh, that people um, help purchase items that uh, uh, were necessary, such as cameras and, and computers. And then even some of the manufacturers themselves, SBIG, uh, Diffraction Limited, and QSI, and QHY have all donated uh, products to uh, AVSO Net. And some of the software vendors, such as DC3 Dreams, that does the uh, ACP, uh, software and Diffraction Limited with Max and DL have donated software. Some of the volunteers, and there are just dozens of volunteers uh, involved in the project, have um, contributed large amounts of their time. Gary Walker, for example, down in the Cape, has built several of the enclosures for the smaller telescopes. And then I also wanted to uh, thank Peter Biello for letting me borrow a few of his slides that he gave at the uh, cellophane this past August. All right. So what is AVSO Net? It's a remotely accessed collection of telescopes. Um, I won't call them worldwide, but there are some in the Northern Hemisphere, there are some in the Southern Hemisphere. And they are used collectively to uh, acquire photometric images for AVSO members. So it's a membership benefit. It started about 16 years ago, 2006. We had access to a telescope in Arizona. And then uh, at an IEU meeting, I uh, negotiated access to a telescope in New Zealand. And so at that point, it became a network of telescopes. And so uh, I started making these available to the AVSO members. And over the years, we've built that up to about a dozen telescopes. They're currently acquiring on the order of 15,000 images per month. And over that 16 year period, we've had about 3 million images that have been taken by the telescopes. As I mentioned, it's run by AVSO volunteers. There's about 30 or so that are involved in the network at this time. And it's for the benefit of AVSO members. Um, of the membership, about 60 people are actually using the telescope as of the first quarter of this year. 
We do have northern and southern hemisphere telescopes. Uh, once you go robotic, it doesn't make any difference how far away the telescope is. You can still uh, uh, utilize it. And then we have both the, the seven inch, 180 millimeter wide field astrographs and also standard sort of uh, 24 inch telescopes uh, involved in the system. And in addition to that, we also uh, calibrate automatically all the images that are taken. So you don't just get raw images off of the system. It actually does the bias subtract, dark subtract, flat fielding, and everything, and puts those in, uh, gives those images to the users. So what is the cost of the system? The cost is AVSO membership. And so, yeah, you say, oh, geez, another uh, club that I have to be a member of. And it isn't exactly cheap. It's $85 a year for adults. Uh, it's cheaper for students and those with limited income. But the advantage of this is that there's no hourly fee. So once you get in, you have access to the network. Um, it's not like you get blocks of time, but what you do is you submit a proposal, simple proposal form that just basically states what target you want to look at and why you want to observe it. And 99 times out of 100, uh, there's a telescope all allocation committee and they will approve that. It's very rare that they don't approve a project and it's primarily because they think that you've made a mistake in in that particular target and it isn't visible or suitable for the network. Um, and as I say, you get all the uh, calibrated data available either on an anonymous FTP site or it's sent automatically to the AVSO's uh, online photometric analysis software tool called VFOT. So there are two of these telescope systems, I guess. So there's like six of these things that are called bright star monitors, which are these astrographs or small refractors. Um, they do photometry basically from like second magnitude down to 14th magnitude. There are neutral density filters and things like that in the filter wheels. And so if you wanted to observe Sirius, you could observe Sirius with these telescopes. The typical field of view is one by one and a half arc, uh, degrees. Um, and again, there's, I think, three in the, in the, three, four in the north and two in the south is the way it works out. And one of the ones in the north is in Hawaii, so it's sort of halfway in between. Now, these are pretty expensive robotic telescopes. The typical equipment cost, if you went out and bought everything new, is about $40,000 per site. So you can also think of this as a way in which you can use some pretty exotic equipment uh, at very minimal cost to you. The faint star monitors are typically telescopes that are not owned by the AVSO. They're owned by universities and other partnerships uh, of amateurs. And they grant the AVSO a certain fraction of the time on the telescope. They are nice in that they will do photometry down to 19th, 20th magnitude, something like that, photometric work. If you wanted to do direct imaging, of course, they would go fainter than that. And there are both northern and southern telescopes in that part of the network as well. Here's a Google map of where the sites are located. You can see there's three sites in the south. Uh, two bright star monitors and one of the 24 inch telescopes, the telescope in Hawaii, and then a bunch of them in the United States. We have the option of putting, of accessing some telescopes elsewhere. Uh, there's one in Chile that we might uh, use sometime around. There's one in Spain right now that uh, may uh, become part of the network in the near future. So the network is expanding, but it, it's expanding very slowly because we feel like 12 telescopes is a lot to maintain and we don't generally add something unless there's really value added to do that. Here's one of these typical Takahashi E180s. This one is the Hawaii setup. Uh, you can see it's on a Paramount ME and you can't really see it but in the back is uh, um, Laser pointer. Morning, the 
is one of the uh, uh, E180, uh, excuse me, uh, ZWO ASI 183 cameras that's on his uh, particular setup. And then there's a computer and everything else sitting down below. This particular enclosure is sort of a flip top. It's more like a roll off, like a Rolodex uh, with linear actuators that control the roof. And so it's very small and very compact. It's one of uh, Gary Walker's designs. Here's the telescope in the South Island of New Zealand uh, on a hill there called Mount John. It's about 1,300 feet above the, the plain. 24-inch uh, telescope, fork-mounted, uh, very nice setup inside of a dome down there. Called OC61 because it's an optical craftsman telescope, 61 centimeter aperture. And since Walt is on um, the Zoom list, I thought I would show this one. This is MPO61, which is a telescope in the Hill Country in Texas. Uh, again, fork mounted, RCOS, big filter wheel, 4K by 4K CCD camera. So, I mean, these things are really top of the line telescopes that you typically don't have access to. And through AVSO Net, you do. Here's some of the data that's been taken by these telescopes. Just pulled it out of the web. Um, and uh, this is actually put together by uh, uh, one of the volunteers for AVSO Net. And you can see three of the short period type stars with uh, four different band passes from the blue over to the uh, I band pass. And over here are just some V band passes of uh, a few eclipsing binaries. And the stuff that's highlighted in color is the stuff from AVSO Net, where somebody has requested observations of these particular objects and then has analyzed the data and submitted it to the uh, AVSO's database. Here are some of the long period variables. Uh, these are with the smaller telescopes, the, the seven inch 180 millimeter. And you can see that even with these telescopes, you can go from like second magnitude here on TCEP down to 16th magnitude or there arounds uh, in the blue band pass. And this is all done with uh, these really small telescopes. So it's amazing the both the magnitude range is accessible by them and the quality of the data that comes off of those. Again, AVSO is primarily interested in variable stars. And so that's why you see all these light curves of, of stars that are varying in brightness. These are uh, Myra variables for the most part that you're seeing here. Notice that, for instance, this particular star, TSEP, has two maxima close together. So this is what's called a double hump uh, Myra variable. And so this particular researcher is interested in, in monitoring these stars and, and generating light curves over long periods of time. Because from one maximum to the next maximum, you know, as the shape of the light curve is different, this is a much rounder uh, shape. And it's also uh, not as bright as it was in the previous one. And so you have to look at these things over long periods of time. And this person, Frank Shore, is willing to sit there for a decade and, and get light curves out of these stars. And you can do this with AVSO Net. You can also do things like transiting exoplanets. Here's WASP 148b. Uh, this is data actually taken with the uh, telescope in my backyard, which is PSM New Hampshire. And you can see that uh, it is capable of, of detecting this uh, exoplanet transit down at sort of the 1% level. So you can do it, but the main problem with this, with AVSO Net, is that this is like a four hour long time series. And if you did this with something like iTelescope, this would cost you a couple hundred dollars just from telescope time. And so, it can be done with AVSO net, but it means that somebody is using one telescope for four hours straight and not allowing other users to use the telescope. So we don't do this as a matter of course, but if you need it for you know, a school project or you need it because uh, there's a scientific um, um, consortium that is looking for supporting data for their HST observations, well then sure, we'll 
we'll grant time to be able to do this kind of uh, long time series. Here's another one again from uh, Walt Cooney's uh, data. This is ZPAL, which is another one of these uh, Myra variables. The pluses, the dark pluses are visual observations. And you can see that over uh, a long period of time, this is 5,000 to, uh, let's use 50,000 to, five, to 55,000. So 5,000 days, uh, the star has had many maxima, but the visual observers were all reporting a minimum somewhere around 13 and a half. And if you look at the finding chart, you can see that there is a companion to ZPAL. This is very close. It's just a few arc seconds away. And you can see that uh, what happens is as ZPAL fades, the visual observer is just looking at the companion and not looking at the, at the target star at all. And that's why it just sits down here at a constant level. Whereas if you use uh, a CCD or a CMOS sensor, you can actually split these two stars and measure ZTAL by itself. And you can see that it actually goes down much fainter, down to 17th, 18th magnitude, not 13 and a half. So it's this kind of thing that you can do with um, long time series, not long time series, long monitoring of uh, these kinds of stars, which is something that AVS ONET is really designed for. So if you go on the web, there are two sites or two URLs to look at. The first one is the general AVSO website. And the reason you might want to just start there is because in there is this thing called membership. And that's where you actually join the AVSO for your 85 bucks. Or if you're a teacher, student, person on limited income, that's actually only $40, which is really a great deal. And you come with other benefits other than AVSO net. And then if you dive down into the website a little bit, there's another um, set of web pages in there, which are AVSO net themselves. Uh, we're in the process of updating that so that the data, the information on it is current. That'll come out in the next couple of weeks. And on that particular set of pages is the proposal form that you're going to use. And this is the proposal form itself. You can see how simple it is. Basically, you just have to tell them the target name, where it's located, how bright it is, and then a brief, you know, few sentence type thing saying why you want to look at this object. Other than that, that's all you really need. So the images, like I said, are fully calibrated, but you are the one who's responsible for doing any analysis of the images after that. Stacking the images, measuring uh, the star brightnesses, uh, sending the data into the AVSO, or if you want to take the, the same data, for instance, the B, V, and R filters are kind of equivalent to R, G, and B. And so if you want to make a tricolor image off of the data that you're getting, you can certainly do that. That's an analysis step that is, you know, in your hands and not in the AVSO's hands. And if you want to do photometry, the AVSO has a tool on the web that uh, is very easy to use to do this, the measurement of the star magnitudes and to actually generate uh, a report that can be submitted to the AVSO. So again, become an AVSO member, submit the simple proposal. Um, and that proposal is sent to a telescope allocation committee whose main purpose is to make sure that what you're asking for is a reasonable request. It's not that we're saying that your science is better than somebody else's. We just want to make sure that you're not trying to do something that the telescopes aren't capable of doing. Um, if the proposal is approved, then time is allocated on a telescope, whether it's north or south, depending on what kind of uh, target you're looking at. The images are taken, sent to you. You get an email that tells you that data is available. Uh, then you analyze the data, submit it, and so on. So there's no hands-on access to any of these telescopes. It's fully automatic and robotic. All you do is you submit a request, you get images back. And here's sort of a flow chart of that. So you submit a proposal to the TAC. It's either sent to a bright star monitor or a faint star monitor. 
the images are calibrated and then they get sent to one of the other uh, the places where you can pick them up. There's all kinds of science projects that you can do. And I mentioned this before when I was talking about variable star work. Uh, this is just an example of you know the kinds of things that you can look at uh, with AVSO net or you know a telescope in your backyard. Plenty of things you can do. The neat thing about it is that it's fully robotic. You don't have to stay up and watch the observations being taken. So in my mind, there's sort of four ways of going robotic. Uh, the first is just sort of a self-contained automatic telescope. And you've seen these around, or at least the ads for them. Things like the Unistellar EV scope, uh, where everything is done for you. Uh, you get images off. They get they put on get put onto your cell phone, and or you can download them from the website. And uh, they're just a simple portable automatic telescope. Doesn't you don't have to set it up for um, uh, doing polar alignment or anything else. Take care of all that stuff for you. They're just absolutely wonderful for star parties. The next level from that, in my mind, is you sort of do timeshare. You purchase time on the telescope, such as eye telescope or the SLU telescopes. Um, or in the case of the membership, you can uh, get time on the AVSO net telescopes. So that's a way of doing it where you don't have to buy the telescope. You just use somebody else's robotic telescope. And it's actually a very good way to start off. It ain't cheap, but uh, uh, you don't have to go through all the headaches of setting up your own telescope. If you do want to set up your telescope, there's sort of two ways of doing it. One is in your backyard, uh, and the other is to do a fully remote installation where the telescope is is outside of your physical control. So it may be, you know, at the um, observing site for the uh, Astronomical Society, or it may be at uh, some friend's place in Arizona, or it may be at a, an actual commercial telescope farm someplace. Um, that step is harder, so I will probably concentrate on the backyard installation in just a few minutes. So the self-contained telescopes, like I mentioned before, they're not, I don't call them cheap, uh, but they, they do a good job. They're just, you know, a lot more expensive than just buying a telescope. And it's because they set everything up for you. And so, you know, they've done all the software configuration and everything else. And so you pay a lot for that. The Unistellar stuff is all designed around a four and a half inch reflector. Uh, and they do pretty darn good for a small telescope like that. Vespera, which is a newcomer, which I just saw an ad for just recently is a little cheaper but because of that you know everything else is a little cheaper too it's a 50 millimeter refractor it has a bigger field of view but a smaller sensor which means that the pixels are much smaller so these are really great tools i think for schools or for star parties or for doing camping and, and vacation work so for instance the vespera telescope over here you can see that it folds up into this compact unit that's easily backpackable and so if you want to take something like this you know when you're out vacationing in the rockies or something like that it's really a neat thing to do the unistellar is a little bigger four and a half inch refractor um and you know physically how big those are but they're wonderful for like i said star parties going on the sidewalk or whatever so they're nice but you're talking three grand or something like that for one of those systems. The timeshare stuff, iTelescope is probably the most widely known of these subscription services. And they have a lot of telescopes that are available for you to rent time on. And usually it's in blocks of time, an hour at a time. Typical fee is something like 40 an hour, but there's also an annual fee and some other fees that get thrown in. And so I don't know what the actual number is when you total it up. Um, but it's fine, uh, and it's a way in which you don't have to do anything. It's done for you. AVSO Net is kind of similar to that in that it's free for the members and everything is done for you. 
but you don't have uh, real control over the telescope. It's not like you get a block of time. It's you submit uh, targets and you get data back. You don't know when that data is going to get taken. Uh, if an image comes through and it's not deep enough or something, well, then you've got to uh, talk to the, the volunteers and have them go and retake the data with, with deeper images, as opposed to you doing it in real time saying, oh, doggone, I didn't expose long enough, I'll take another exposure. Um, and the other thing is that it takes a few days for the observations to start. So if you're doing some time critical thing, you just heard about a new nova that went off, something like this, and you want data tonight. It's kind of difficult to do that with ABSO net because you have to submit this proposal. It has to go through this committee, which can take a day or two. It has to be scheduled on the telescopes, which can take a day or two. So it might be three, four, or five days before your observations actually are in the queue to be taken. So the, the big difference in, is, in my mind, is uh, between robotic, which to me is just a remote control telescope, um, which can be in your backyard, can be uh, wherever you want, often is used in some sort of a roll off or permanent enclosure. Um, and, but what it means is that you have to physically sort of start it up and decide what objects you're going to look at and things like this. And you sort of have to use the telescope all night long. It's just that you have access to like the computer desktop. And the other one is automatic or autonomous, where there's scheduling software that's involved. So you just give it a cue, a list of objects to look at, and it moves from one to the other all night long uh, with minimal delay in between objects and can also use weather info information to uh, uh, shut the telescope down if it looks like it's getting cloudy or there's a chance of rain or something like that. This latter thing where it's the computer that's doing all of the work means that it's more difficult to do reliably. You don't have a human in the link. So if you put a robotic telescope in your backyard, it's pretty easy to do because you can just walk back there and fix things as they break. Uh, the, the equipment can be your old stuff. You know, you've upgraded, you've gotten the bigger telescope, you've gotten the fancier camera, and you don't know what to do with that older camera and so on. Well, you could set up a small robotic variable star monitoring telescope generate data while you're still doing your deep sky imaging with your bigger telescope. Um, and if it's in your backyard, it doesn't have to be as robust because if, if it hangs up or something, you just go out and reset it. Um, there's no rental charges if it's sitting in your backyard. It means that you are limited to whatever sky conditions that you have. If you're in an urban environment, you think you can't go very deep or something like that. Well, certainly if you're trying to do some deep sky object, it's difficult to do that in an urban environment. But if you're looking at a ninth magnitude variable star, it's really easy to do, even in downtown Manchester. So, you know, don't be afraid from that point of view. Uh, so, that's the neat thing about working with variable stars, or stars of all brightnesses, all the way, you know, from naked eye all the way as faint as you want. You just pick and choose which ones you want to, to follow. So here's kind of a typical backyard setup. I just went to OpCorp and uh, uh, picked some items there. So if you bought everything new, this is the kind of configuration that you might end up with. Some sort of a camera with filter wheels and filters. That kind of runs into the sort of a couple thousand dollar level. You have to have an electronic focuser. You need a go-to mount. Um, the uh, telescope can be almost anything. I just sort of picked an eight inch as a kind of a typical quantity. You need some sort of a computer to control all this stuff. And then you need software on that computer, such as Maxim DL. Maxim DL is kind of the gold standard for uh, handling cameras. And it isn't cheap, $650 is a lot of money to spend for software, but it actually performs pretty darn well. So you're looking at something like six to $7,000. If you bought everything new, and put something in your backyard, this would be a perfectly adequate system uh, 
And, you know, you can pick and choose what mount you want to use or anything else. There's a whole variety of those that uh, fit in that screen category. But it doesn't include an enclosure. It doesn't include the cables. Uh, you'll run into a whole bunch of other miscellany things that, that add into that. Um, but it's, it's a good start. Now, if you want to go robotic, or excuse me, remote, so you take that same telescope and you move it someplace outside of your control, it's harder to do. The one thing is, if you have a mount that um, fails every now and then, um, it uh, loses track of where it is, then it's hard to figure out remotely where the telescope is pointed and how to recover from that kind of situation. And so for that reason, if you go remote where it's no longer in your control, the mount is probably the biggest thing that you want to deal with. Uh, upgrade it to something that's a much more reliable mount, such as a Mighty. There are a number of those that are sort of the same category, but you're talking instead of a $1,500, $2,000 mount, you're talking eight to 10000 So it's a big jump. And that's why, you know, people don't do robotic telescopes unless they have the, the pocketbook to, um, to fit the needs. If you want to go remote, the other thing that you might want to do is to go to an automatic mode. So you're using scheduling software. ACP is the gold standard there. Uh, but it's not cheap. It's like a thousand bucks. If you're doing everything yourself so that your telescope is the only one that's inside of the enclosure, then that enclosure has to be highly reliable. Um, because if it fails and the rainstorm is coming uh, over, your equipment's going to get wet. And if it's, you know, a thousand miles away from you, uh, it's Pretty hard to recover from a, a situation like that. So you want UPS power, you want a weather station, you want alert software on your computer so that if it does look bad, it closes up automatically. So that's the kind of thing that you know you run into when you start dealing with the remote setup. There's a lot more things required in order to make it reliable. And uh, if you locate it far away from you, then you remember that you're going to have to go out and maintain that equipment if you're doing it yourself. And you got to include that in the pricing of the whole setup. The other option is to lease space at a telescope farm, such as New Mexico Skies. Uh, Sierra Remote Observatories in California is another choice. Obstech is a uh, site down in Chile. And they're wonderful sites. They include, you know, the infrastructure for the for running the telescope you put your telescope down there they will set it up for you they will maintain it they give you power and internet and the whole works and usually in a very dark clear site the obstech stuff in chile for example uh, i don't think they guarantee it but you typically get over 300 clear nights a year so i mean it just generates data like you couldn't believe but they're not cheap they'll cost you one to two thousand dollars a month for one of those for a uh, peer at one of those telescope farms. So that adds up to something like, you know, $18,000 a year. And you had this $6,000 telescope that you're using in your backyard. You want to put a $6,000 telescope down someplace where you're spending $18,000 a year to have somebody run it. Probably not. So then what you start talking about, well, let's increase the telescope to a bigger one. Let's improve the mount. Let's get a bigger camera and so on. And all of a sudden you're pushing, you know, forty to sixty thousand dollars for that equipment. Not cheap, but man, you get telescope time in Chile. Uh, an example of this is the Middleman Atmob Observatory, which uh, some of you probably are aware of. This was donated by the Middleman Foundation. Um, and it's a again a Paramount ME, uh, CDK 17. QHY 600 inside of a, a roll-off roof enclosure. This is sort of a $40,000, $60,000 telescope setup. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people who are doing robotic work, this is the kind of telescope that they end up with. 
So let me give you a few lessons that I've learned over the couple of decades that I've been doing this stuff. The first is that when you put an automated telescope somewhere where the skies are good, they produce enormous quantities of data because you are not stopping in between observations. It just goes from one to the next to the next to the next. You can easily end up with a thousand images every night. And you got to do something with these things. And so one of the things is that, okay, it's a very expensive setup, but you can do it as a partnership, three, four, five people, each one of you getting 25% of the time on the telescope, you are still getting more data than you do in your backyard. And yet you, you have, you have this really pristine site. And now, um, you're sharing the load of all the work involved in running the telescope. And so partnerships are, are a very common thing with, uh, uh, remote telescopes. I know of one, uh, plane wave one meter telescope at New Mexico skies that was just put in. And it would, again, was a partnership between about four guys put that in. It's a million dollar setup. So it means $250,000 a piece that these people are spending. But, you know, they have a pristine telescope and a pristine site. Um, the next thing is the mount is probably the critical piece in the whole thing when you're dealing with a remote telescope. So you can never spend too much money for it. Get the best mount that you can afford. Enclosures are a pain for almost everybody. If you're dealing with a telescope farm, they provide the enclosure. They have a big roll-off roof or whatever, and they're the ones who are maintaining it and make sure that it works and everything. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, there's a lot of logistics involved in dealing with these enclosures and making sure that they are just totally reliable. They never fail. And along those lines, I've never been satisfied with the domes that you can buy on the amateur market. They just seem to be, uh, cheaply made and not reliable enough for automatic work. Um, I think roll-offs are better. The problem with a roll-off is that you need to make sure the roof is high enough so that it clears the telescope at all positions because one of the common things you run into is something goes wrong with the telescope. You got to close the roof until somebody can come out and, and look at it. And if the telescope is in some, you know, close to the zenith or something like that, you have to make sure the roof can close with the telescope in that position, or uh, it may the roof may have to stay open until somebody can get out there. So that's one of the critical things with a roll off. If you're doing remote stuff, an all sky camera is awfully nice to have, but they're they're kind of hard to find that are reliable weatherproof things. I mean, they're one to two to three thousand uh, dollars. You can build one yourself using like a Raspberry Pi and it, it's a camera that you can get for it. Uh, they're really quite nice little cameras, but you got to do the software. You got to build a little enclosure and things like that. And so uh, you can do it and there's software available to run it in the proper mode, but somebody has to build it for you or you have to go out and spend the money. Um, as you are well aware, cables stiffen when cold. You don't want a cable to break on you when you're a thousand miles away from it. Mounts also stiffen with cold. You have to watch out how you grease them and you, ought, you have to do it on a, uh, uh, a schedule. Usually annually to go out and make sure that the, the mount is working properly. Again, if you're doing robotic work, it's not like you're just going out there on the weekends. It means the telescope is running all the time. And so it, it gets exercised far more than it does when it's in your backyard. Uh, we tend to use USB hubs and power hubs on the telescope so that there's no cables running uh, from the ground through the telescope in any way other than an ethernet car, uh, cable and a 12 volt power. And everything else uh, uh, is 
resident on the telescope itself, so the cables are shorter and they don't flex. USB 3, which is what all the CMOS cameras are today, is a challenge because you really it's hard to get long distances with USB 3 without doing some really uh, tricky things. And so what we tend to do is we take one of the ultra small form factor uh, computers and we put it directly on the mount so that the connection between the computer and the camera is on the order of two meters. And then USB 3 is a lot easier to deal with. If you start talking 10 meters, uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We like to put a webcam in our enclosures because it's nice to be able to look at the telescope and see what the position is and uh, whether there's a problem that needs to be debugged and solved. Um, we have a processing pipeline for ABSO Net. There are various scripts that are available on like Maxim DL to do a lot of this processing. If you're dealing with a partnership, it gets a little more complex. And that's why you know we have a standalone pipeline that we've developed. Uh, but again, you're, if you're using a telescope a lot, there's a lot of images coming down. You can't get behind. You really need to figure out a way of doing this where it's the least impact on your time. And if you're going to do something remote, I always say that you test the system in your backyard probably for several months before you ship it. So you buy the equipment, you have it delivered to your house, you set it up, you test it all out, then you pack it back up and you ship it to your, to your remote site. It's so much easier to solve the problems when it's in your backyard than when it's a thousand miles away from you. So this is my observatory. Um, this was Mario Mata's uh, setup. Um, what you have over here is a 32-inch fork-mounted telescope. Uh, this enclosure here is the ABSO net telescope. Uh, and then I have another enclosure, which is currently empty, but will be uh, I'll be putting a Polaris monitor telescope there uh, relatively soon. And what I wanted to do is, if I can figure out how to do this, um, I'm going to bring up the telescope, this telescope that's in the backyard. Uh, notice one thing here. This again. Um, this one post is sitting here. This post has an all sky camera at the top. It also has a Boltwood weather sensor at the top. And so this is the thing that is the, the uh, metrology information that's necessary to monitor this telescope and tell whether it's going to be open or closed. All right, let's see if I can figure out. I have to stop share for a second. Okay, and somewhere down in here. All right, so this is the telescope that's in the backyard. Did that come through on the screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is just a VNC connection to the telescope that's in the backyard, and the telescope is running right now. So Maxim DL is over here, and so, you know, you're getting the view of what images are being currently taken. In the background is the Boltwood uh, cloud sensor. So it says it's clear, there's no wind, it's dry, and it's dark currently. Um, so here you have Maxim DL where it's doing this. Uh, ACP is this other window over here, tells you what you're uh, currently looking at, uh, and it has a status information which is uh, scrolling through the various observations. You can see right now it's in an R filter, uh, 1.7 seconds. And then this is the scheduler part here, um, which is the thing that actually 
uh, decides what you're going to be looking at. And so in here are a whole bunch of programs of various things. So for instance, the uh, I showed you the images of those uh, uh, double hump uh, Myra variables. Here is the program that does all of those. And so for instance, if you look at R query, it says that it's going to do a BVRI set, two images in B, two images in D, four, set 10 images in R, 10 images in I. So whenever it does this particular observation, those are the images that are taken. And then for each one of those, it'll tell you what the exposure time is and things like that. So this is the kind of thing that you have to set up in order to make a, a, a system like this actually run. And then in the background, we are using Focus Max for not only adjusting the offsets between the various filters, but also uh, to uh, automatically focus the telescope every now and then. It goes through an autofocus routine. It can do it with temperature compensation as well, but we don't have it set up that way. And uh, what else I want to show you? I want to show you the, uh, this is the uh, internal camera. And you can see that where the telescope is currently, there's actually two telescopes here. There is a 12 inch telescope uh, with a QHY 600 that can take data. And then there's one of these uh, E180, astrographs with uh, dual filter wheels and an uh, ASA, ASI 183 camera on the back end of it. And so it has a really wide range of filters that you can do with, with this particular uh, this particular setup. But you can see that while I've been talking, this telescope has been taking data. And it just does this every night. And so uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, going out for, for dinner or going for vacation or something like that, it'll just take data. And so it's just pretty amazing what these things are capable of doing. All right, so with that, I think I'm done. Now let me see if I can. Stop the share and turn it back over to Joe. Uh, Arnie, um, a couple of questions right off the bat. The scheduler that you just showed, the all those all those um, scheduled events are they things that were submitted to the committee and they sliced and diced and fed them into the schedule? Is that how it worked? Yep, that's how it works. And so, like I said, there are 60 users that are currently on the telescope, and each one of those users has a half dozen objects or something like that. So it adds up to a lot of targets that are in the queue, but some of those won't come up until three o'clock in the morning. And others uh, um, are just very short exposures, and so you can just skip from one to the next. And so it, it, it's amazing how well these things can, can operate. Usually, this telescope takes about a thousand images a night. Um, some of those are very short. Uh, because of saturation on bright targets. And so there's automatic software that stacks short images. So at the end of the night, we typically have something like 300 images that are proper depth that come out of something in the order of 70, 80 different targets. And this is just off of the telescope that's in my backyard. Cool. Used about 100 nights a year. So that that's cool. My my other question is more of the science base. Ar Arnie, I wouldn't know which star to study or what to do with the data or or what conclusion to to make. I see these light curves and I you know they're they're interesting, but I don't know who to feed that to or or what paper to write because of it. Help me out on this. Yeah, well. The main thing to remember is that the AVSO does not require that you are a researcher who is going to use the observations and analyze them and submit a paper. What they're looking for are contributors, people who will go out and observe these targets, measure the brightness, and submit the brightness observations to the AVSO. And they give you 
on the web page and on a couple of videos just how you go about doing that. And so you don't have to be the scientist. What you are doing is giving the observations to the scientists who can then analyze that data. And so it's a lot simpler than it looks like. And so it's uh, it's a way of contributing without having to know a whole lot about it. And, you know, people who are doing deep sky images are uh, vastly better with PixInsight than I am. Uh, but VFO is trivial to learn. And all you're trying to do is just measure the brightness of a couple objects. And so it's not like taking 30 hours of data and trying to get the gradient out and, you know, tweak this knob and tweak that knob. None of that stuff is essential. It's just really simple observations. All right. Very good. That, that explains it well. Larry? I have a question um, on the scheduling. Uh, so when you um, submit a proposal and you can't make an observation for whatever reason, how does that work? Does it just pause the queue or does it uh, keep on going and it comes around again? Uh, how does that work? It has a uh, algorithm inside of it, which does sort of priority scheduling. And so what it says is, okay, I finished looking at this particular target. Let's look at the list of available targets and see which is the next one I should observe. And so it decides based on, well, how far away from the current position is that target? Um, what are the constraints of that observation? Is it, is, did you put in constraints saying it shouldn't be observed as close to the moon? Uh, or that you needed good sky conditions instead of poor sky conditions? I mean, you know, so there's a whole uh, set of constraints that it looks at. And it looks at all the targets that are available, and it decides which is the next one that it's going to observe. And it tries to do that in an optimal way. And so it's a complex operation and it doesn't always do what you think it should do, um, but it maximizes the efficiency of the telescope. Um, and so if it misses a target on a given night, it will try to do that target the next night. Um, if you decide that it's missing it too often, you can manually raise its priority and say, I want you to observe this thing now, and it will go and do that. But if you do that, you're kind of violating what it wants to do. What it wants to do is optimize the use of the telescope. So for our purposes, when we have hundreds of targets, that's the way we let, just let it run and let it optimize itself. But if you have, say, an exoplanet transit that's happening tonight, and it's going to happen starting 2 a.m. and finishes at 4 a.m. Then you can schedule it so that it will observe that particular object, excluding everything else in its queue, because you have put tight constraints on that particular observation, and it will do it for you. So it's, it's a fancy piece of software. That's one of the reasons why it's expensive. There are a couple of others that are available. Uh, software, uh, excuse me, Sequence Generator Pro is another one. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if you look around, there's probably several other uh, scheduling um, software packages that are out there. You don't have to use what we use on uh, AVSO Net. Part of the reason we use things like ACP is because that software has been donated to the network. And so we don't really care how expensive it is because the, the vendor has given it to us. Um, and you as a, as a private individual may want to just sort of search around and see if there's some piece of software that will do what you need it to do. Or use AVS on that. <laughs> Any other questions for, for Arnie? Uh, I'm I'm a little surprised. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, I have this is Lynn. I have a question. Lynn. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, if you could speak up, I can barely hear you. How's that? Better. 
So I do have uh, my my own remote system in the backyard. So mm -hmm. I, the only I have a question about power. So I I do have to turn my camera on and off. Is there a recommended gadget, for lack of other term, to be able to remotely turn the power on and off? Yeah, there's two ways of doing that. Uh, one is 115 volt or 110 volt web power strip. Uh, Digital Loggers makes these. They're $120 or something like that. And they handle sort of eight ports, eight outlets, and they are web based. So you get a web page and you can turn each of the outlets on and off. But they do it with, you know, the 110 volts. So that means that you got to plug your power supply into that. And then you can turn that power supply on and off. The other way of doing it is switching with 12 volts. And so what you do then is you run one 12 volt line up to a power hub, basically, that switches 12 volts. And you can turn each one of the 12 volt lines on and off. Uh, so basically, you don't have to have all these individual power supplies. You just have to have one that's bigger that can control all these various uh, pieces of equipment, and then you turn them on and off again with either USB or a web-based uh, control program. One of those is like a Pegasus. If you look up Pegasus on on uh, the web, uh, you'll see what those devices are, and those are what we use on AVSO Net. And they not only handle USB ports, but they also handle 12 volts. And you can turn them on and off. They give you readings of what the amperage is on each one of the ports, and so it gives you a lot of engineering data. Uh, but again, they're not cheap. But there are some other solutions. I think ASI has one, uh, and um, or excuse me, ZWO has one, I should say. Um, and um, it's really nice to be able to control the power on every piece of equipment that you have remotely. It just solves a lot of issues that, that uh, uh, you would run into, that you have to go outside and you have to go and switch things on and off and it's cold outside and you really don't want to do that. Um, these remote switches are just wonderful. Okay, so, okay, second question. And I don't know if you folks deal with this. So I'm running, Everything's plugged into a, a mini PC out in a dry box. Yeah. And if the power goes off for some reason, that mini PC isn't going to reboot. Is there, I don't know, is there a way to make your, so probably anybody can answer this. I just don't know the, the answer. Um, is there a way you can reboot a PC remotely? Yeah. So there's a couple things. Um, first is you can use a UPS so that you don't have to worry about that. Most UPSs with those small uh, computers can support a brownout or a power outage for you know 30 minutes or, or even an hour. And mm -hmm. so it's a way of sort of writing over things. Um, the computer itself, if you go into the BIOS, you can actually set it so that uh, when power comes back on, it automatically reboots. And then there are actually software packages that will do that for you as well. Okay. Uh, so there, there's many there's many solutions. You just have to find the one that works for you. Thank you. Good questions, Lynn. Any other questions for Arnie? Arnie, this this was most interesting. I may I may email you offline more about selecting targets and and other things. This is this is pretty intriguing. So I'm um, I'm curious. And 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 on that note, I um, I want to thank you very much. Sure, happy to do it. All right, Ar Arnie, you're you're always welcome to stay. I think you're a member, right? So you're you're welcome to stay. Of course, I am going to um, finish this recording.